So, um, thank you for being here. It was quite an honor to be asked to present uh, Brainerd, during Brainerd History Week. Um, I love the city of Brainerd. I love cities in general, and I love talking about them. I'm going to apologize up front because what part of this presentation was going to do is it's going to uh, give you different eyes in which to see the city. And like my daughter on the right will tell you, uh, it will make you a little crazy. We drive down the street now and she'll say, oh, that's so stupid. Why do they do that? And it's <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, I'm going to poison your mind a little bit, but in a, in a, in a good way. I wonder where she got that from. Yeah, no, no kidding. Um, you two can, can, can cut out the electronics anytime you're ready. And uh, you can uh, you pay attention because there will be a quiz before you get ice cream tonight. Ooh, on all this. Um, you got an eye roll. Yeah, I know. That's because she's now 11. She thinks she can eye roll now. Um, I, I, they asked me what, to, what I was going to call this presentation. I had no idea. So I made something up. But uh, as, as, as I started putting together, I thought, I, I, I want to talk about from grid to great, the idea that how Brainerd was built in this grid system, what the implications of that are, and how that uh, is really a path to greatness for the city. And we're going to talk about why that is and why that came about. There's two overall themes. And the, these are... These are um, kind of the, the umbrella under which everything else goes. And it really it is important to kind of put ourselves back in the mindset of the people who were first here in the late 1800s, getting the city started, setting it up, laying it out. What, what, what were they thinking? And there's two things that we have to do to get back into their mindset. The first one is we have to uh, try to experience the city at two miles an hour instead of 30 miles an hour. When you think about the city at two miles an hour, which is the way everybody back in those days would have experienced it, it becomes a very, very different place than when you experience it at 30 miles an hour. When you experience it at 30 miles an hour, it, it, it warps time and space. It, everything kind of changes. When you actually experience it the way they experienced it, which was on foot, all of a sudden, a, a whole bunch of different things jump out at you that are not readily apparent at 30 miles an hour. The other thing is that I, I'm going to talk in some ways nostalgically about some of the things that people did and the way they set up this place because quite frankly it's brilliant and what they did was brilliant and it follows a pattern of brilliance that really is descended from literally thousands of years of people building cities and figuring out how to make cities work. Um, but it was all designed around the notion that we were going to build wealth. We were going to make people wealthy. These were uh, designs and setups to create uh, wealth and make people rich. Um, sometimes we look back and we say, why, why are people so selfish today? Why are people so greedy today? Uh, it, you know, and the, the inference is that people weren't that way in the past. They were. <laughs> the way this was set up was designed to build wealth. But I'm going to show you how that framework was a little bit, was in, a, in many ways different than what we have today. And the outcomes from a wealth standpoint were a little bit different too. Before we get to Brainerd, I, I want to start in a brief overview of settlement of North America. Obviously, North America was settled before Europeans got here. But when we got here, we brought cities. We brought a different way of building, a different way of setting things up. Welcome, Mary. It's so I'm nice so to see you. I no, be here to welcome you. I understand. Thank you, and thank it's you in so the much. With my husband. Yes, I hope everything's okay. It's looking like it might. Well, thank you for being here. It means a lot. And I brought cookies. Oh, wonderful! Now they really like me. When, uh, when, when Europeans arrived here, uh, we set up our first cities uh, along the navigable routes, right, along the waterways. And you see the great cities of the East Coast, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, all were based around ports. When people arrived, they didn't have often a, a, a set program, a set plan for how they were going to build. You, you read the Mayflower Compact, and it has a little bit of 
here's how people are going to own properties and here's how things are going to be set up. You can go to a city like Savannah or Charleston where there was a very formal plan put in place of here's where streets are going to be, here's where parks are going to be. Even though there was nothing there at the time, they would set these things up and lay them out to, to grow into them. Uh, but a lot of these were very haphazard undertakings. You get a city like Philadelphia uh, with the Quakers um, and William Penn, there, there was a lot of, this is probably the most, the greatest amount of forethought into a city in those initial ones in terms of the layout and the design, uh, where the streets would go, where the buildings would go, and what the framework for development would be. In many ways, this became the inspiration for uh, expansion west and what became known as uh, you know all of the all the land west of the Ohio so the original what they called the West back then which we would call the the East today right the Appalachians uh, Iowa or uh, I'm sorry Ohio Indiana uh, these places Michigan and then ultimately with the Louisiana purchase uh, became you know manifest destiny stretching uh, through the through the Midwest and the West, and then ultimately the West Coast. In 18 or 1785, Thomas Jefferson sat on a committee of five people that came up with the grid system that was supposed to essentially organize development uh, of the West. And this would stretch all the way to the West Coast. And today we see uh, places built on this system. It essentially split the country up into townships, six miles by six miles square, 36 square miles. The brilliance of the system, and Jefferson argued for a 10 mile square, but the argument was that that was too far to walk. They went to six miles by six miles because you could, in a day, walk uh, from, from, from the edge to the middle is basically what it was. But what you have in this system is a way to split these 36 miles into sections, split each section then down further down into you know quadrants, 640 acres, 160, 40 acres, 10, all the way down to the block level. The idea was we were mass producing a country on a you know a platform, and how are we going to do this the quickest and most efficient? The fear at the time was if we don't get a bunch of settlers out there, the French are going to come and they've claimed everything on the Mississippi. They're just going to take this whole thing over. And, and we're going to be limited to this part of the coast. And actually, the fear was we were going to be surrounded. And so the idea was we wanted to get as many people out there as quickly as we could and settle it. And so what you're looking at is essentially assembly line building America. What is the system we can set up so that we can go out and inhabit all of this land very quickly, subdivide it, get it, get it developed, and, and get it into productive use? so that it becomes, in a sense, ours, squatter's rights, in a sense. We own it, we're there, you can't kick us off. When we get to our part of the world, uh, first of all, you can see where the, the one mile by one mile sections come in to play. But you also have this weird thing here, right, the Mississippi. And you can see how the surveyors were coming from this side and coming from this side, and they met here, and oops, they're a little bit off, right? <laughs> um, we have some some uh, you know, tolerance for these people because they were pulling chains through the woods uh, back before you know, uh, there were trails or anything else. This was really hazardous work and uh, it's amazing that they were actually that close in many ways given the tools that they had. So this set up our part of the world into these six by six grids. And then uh, of course it was the decision of the railroad to locate here in Brainerd as opposed to in Barrows, which was another option that was being pushed, or a little bit further north, in terms of that river crossing, that decided that Brainerd, the city, would be here. When we go back to William Penn and we go back to those cities on the East Coast, a lot of those were built with the idea of survival. We're actually going to, you know, come in. Uh, we're going to have the you know, Jamestown or the Mayflower Compact or what, whatever it's going to be, and we're going to try to make a city that will survive. By the time you get to here, it wasn't about survival. It was actually now about the dollar sign. We were, gonna, we were making money. And when we look at the way these cities were, were laid out, they were laid out uh, with an eye to uh, the development plan of the railroads. 
The railroads drove expansion in this part of the country. And so the way they set things up, the way they laid them out, the way they designed the cities was all around maximizing the value. Maximizing the value for who? Well, first it was for the railroads. And it's really important to understand that railroads sometimes acquired land, but often they were given land by the federal government. The idea was we wanted the railroads to expand. That was part of the whole westward expansion. We're going to get the railroads out there. It's going to be good for America, good for uh, you know our economy, good for settlers, good for everything that we were trying to do in the American project. Uh, the railroads would come in then, and the railroads served two you can think of railroads as being two separate companies. One company was the company that operated the railroad. And the other company was the company that built the railroad and built the cities. And they were under the same roof, the same company, but they kind of operated in two separate ways because there were two separate financing schemes that went with it. When you were out laying down the railroad line, where did you get that money to build that line? you would get it from selling off the land in the cities. So what the railroad would do is they would come in, they would lay the line, they would build, they would plat out the city and lay it out. And then they would sell that land off and they would use the proceeds from that to pay for the railroad line. Now, the fact that the railroad line came made the land far more valuable. And so it was kind of a way for them to recoup their upfront costs, their capital costs. Now, the railroad also had the part that operated the railroad then. How did they, what did they do with that money? That money that they charge you to, to ride the railroad or to ship something across the country, they would charge you, that was essentially money they used for the operations and maintenance. So they would fix the line with the fares, they would construct the line with land speculation. That meant that a very important part of westward expansion, particularly in this part of the world, was the land speculator. Here you go, Stella. This Stella, like, this is her favorite slide because she thought the Monopoly guy is cool. The, the, the land speculators. The land speculators played a huge role because what they would do is they would, just like any kind of housing bubble, come in and buy up all this land ahead of time. The railroads would come in and the railroads would say, hey, uh, we're coming to this city. We need the capital. We need the money. We're not individual, you know, we're not going to have realtors out selling individual lots. We're laying out this great town called Brainerd. It's on the Mississippi River. It's going to be the greatest. Don't you want in? And they would, you know, out of Chicago or out of New York or wherever, they would sell off to land speculators all these different lots. And the speculators would come in and they would look at the plat. They'd look at the actual layout. And sight unseen most times, you know, they had never even been on the ground they would buy up what they thought were going to be the best lots. They would, they would stake those out and they would make their claim. Interestingly, just from a historical standpoint, uh, we just went through this housing bubble here, particularly in this part of the world, but California, Florida, uh, you know, Arizona. But we experienced it here too. Uh, back in 1870, uh, you know, uh, roughly the time this was found, the city was, was founded. In 1873, we started what has become known as the Long Depression, uh, or the Long Depression of the 1870s. Uh, what this was, was essentially a railroad-driven housing bust. Uh, we had so much money getting poured into building new cities uh, out in this part of the world that the railroads just got ahead of themselves. The speculators pouring in capital, the money coming in from literally from Wall Street, very similar to what we went through, uh, inflated the market, the railroads overbuilt, and there was a massive correction. A lot of the consolidation that happened in the railroad industry in this time uh, happened because a lot of railroads went bankrupt. They didn't have the money because the land deals and the speculators all fell through. For us, uh, what it meant is that the speculators weren't as great of a force here. A lot of the land was actually sold off relatively cheaply uh, in comparisons to what you saw in, in other places. We kind of came of age during the, the original bust. So the third group then was the pioneers. And pioneers would move to an area like this. We were talking about my great-grandparents. Uh, Great-great-grandparents, uh, before we got started here, moved here and homesteaded a place outside of town. And at this 
period of time, uh, 90, I'm going to say 98%, it might have been 97 or 96, almost everybody in this country was a farmer. <laughs> Very few people lived in cities. But there were enough people who looked at the city as a place to, again, make money, make their fortune, make things work, that they would move here and become part of it. And so again, cities grew up, cities came about because of the economic opportunity. People saw a way to make investments, uh, people saw a way to grow their own wealth and their own fortunes by being part of these pioneering people. This is Brainerd in 1870. This is the oldest shot that I've ever seen of the city. This is Front Street. You can imagine you know, the lumberjacks getting off at the train stop and planing out the wood and, and popping up these little shacks. This is what we did, thousands of these across the country, all over the place, right? And the fascinating thing about this style of development uh, is that what you're really looking at here is a small bet, a little experiment. Would this place work? And there was a handful of people, and they you know, stood out here and got their photo taken. These people thought this place would work, right? But you could probably go to Barrows and see the same picture, right? At the time, you could go to Pillager, you could go to wherever. The, these were little bets. And we built thousands of these across the country for a variety of complex reasons. You know, reasons that in retrospect we can kind of see what happened, but at the time nobody had any idea. A lot of these places, when they started like this, they failed. This didn't, it didn't work out. The railroad decided to go in six miles north and the place just faded and went away. What happened when a place like this failed? Did the stock market crash? Did, you know, unemployment skyrocket? No. A few people who were gambling, essentially speculating that this would be the next city to catch on, they lost some of their money. They would salvage you know, the stuff that they could, and they'd, they'd move on to the next city, the city that was growing. When you got to one of those cities that was growing, though, uh, when you know, everything kind of came together, again, you couldn't really predict it ahead of time. It just something clicked, something happened. Uh, what you see is you have a development pattern that provided a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. Because what you had is you had a system of incremental development. So these cities would grow incrementally up, they would grow incrementally out, and they would become incrementally more intense. So while in 1870 you were only attracting kind of the very, you know, risk embracing, uh, you know, the the, 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 the kind of craziest among us that would go out to the far edges of the wilderness and make their claim and try to, you know, grow something, by the time you get to the early 1900s, you now have a system that has a, a, a lot broader range of investment opportunities. So if you are a wealthy person, uh, as this city is growing incrementally up, incrementally out, and becoming incrementally more intense, uh, there's a lot of places for you to invest money. There's a lot of buildings for you to buy. There's a lot of places that are successful now. If you're an upstart, understand that as this city is growing incrementally out, out on the edge, what does it look like out on the edge of town? It looks a lot like this. So this city was able to accommodate people who were at the upstart face in life at the same time that it was able to accommodate people who were a little bit wealthier, a little bit less risk averse, a little bit, uh, you know, more established in a sense. And of course, in this framework, as the city kept growing incrementally up, incrementally out, and incrementally more intense, after another 40 years, those wood buildings would be replaced by buildings of brick and granite. This is how, in this traditional framework, cities would grow and people within them would grow wealthy. Now we're going to talk a little bit in a, in a minute about the individual family dynamic. But in a sense, you have a community framework here that uh, needs poor upstart people, people trying to bootstrap. It needs wealthy people who are able to make large investments. And it needs everyone in the entire spectrum in between to make this kind of system work. Of course, the people who are living here at this time 
if you had asked them, what is your greatest aspiration for what this city would look like a hundred years from now, what would they say? They would say, you know, Manhattan, right? <laughs> because literally, Manhattan at one point looked exactly like this. It looked exactly like this. It is a grid. Every place grew on this continuum. It grew incrementally up, incrementally out, and the buildings would become incrementally more intense. As you got to a higher level of use, the buildings would be torn down, and something more intense, something more grand, something uh, better would be built in its place. And so literally, this is a development style of continuous, ongoing improvement over a broad spectrum over a long period of time. At Strong Towns, we call this a good party. And I, I, I want to pause here and go into some depth about this because it's, it's really important. Because now today when we talk about cities, we often talk about governments. But back in these days, cities were not governments. Cities were a collection of people and businesses. And there was some government that helped make things work. But city wasn't a government. City was something completely different. And this is because these cities were what we call a good party. What is a good party? A good party, imagine you're throwing a party and everybody that shows up to your party brings more food and more drink and more frivolity than they, they take out, right? Everybody that shows up brings more stuff with them. What do you do in a party like that? You, you open the doors wide and you invite everybody in because everybody who comes makes the party better, right? What is a bad party? <laughs> A bad party is where everybody who shows up drinks more than they bring, eats more than they bring, doesn't contribute more than what they bring. And what do you do in a bad party? You just shut the door, right? Like we don't want anybody else in. Cities, in their original manifestation, their original layout and design, they literally pre-Depression America extending back through all of American history and really all of cities' history for thousands of years were, by their nature, a good party. The more people that showed up, the better things got. I'm an engineer and I like graphs, so I want to show you what this looks like from a graph standpoint. If you think of the city of Brainerd back in the early 1900s, um, or you know the, the late 1800s, what happened was, and this is a, the, up here you've got private investment, and down here you've got public investment. So private investment, the, invest, the wealth that everybody is investing and creating in the community. The public investment is the taxes and the revenue that we're collecting that we're spending. What you saw in a good party kind of system was that initially the trains, the, you know, the railroad would come to town, they would plat out, they'd build it, the speculators would come in with the money. Then pretty soon you got more people building here and you got more storefronts. And then, oh, you got even more building, and you would get those incremental bursts of building that would happen. That's that incremental pattern over a broad area over a long period of time. What you would see then in this good party is that the, the more private investment you had, the more public investment could follow. So all of a sudden, wow, we got enough people to have a fire brigade. Great, our city won't burn down now. That's, that's a real positive, right? Oh. Now we can actually start a waterworks. We can actually have a water tower because we, we have enough people to afford that. And then, oh, now we have so many people we can put in a library and make, some, make the streets kind of nice here in the downtown. And if you go back and look at those photos, you see the initial photos of the streets are dirt, the second one they're gravel, the third one they're paved. A good party means the more people that show up, the more people that add to our party, what happens is we can do more stuff. We can make our city better. And so there was this framework and system where, okay, everybody that comes in, we're going to invest a little bit more, we're going to grow a little bit more incrementally, and wow, we're going to be able to do more things. Let's contrast this with the bad party, which is really the way we go about doing things today. And if you look at this, I've got the same uh, public investment, private investment uh, scenario, but as opposed to this one, they're flipped. The way we tend to do things today we go out, build the highway, run the utilities, construct frontage roads, expand water treatment, all this to handle demand, and then we, we go out and we try to get growth and development to backfill. That's 
our MO today. That's the way we approach development today. And what happens when you, when you do it this way is you end up with a bad party. You already have a paved road. You already have a library. You already have a fire department. Everybody that shows up just takes more capacity from you. Everybody that shows up now, the road's busier, right? There's more people at the library. The park is fuller. The, so what happens is that there's a disincentive for incremental development. The more people we add, it doesn't get better. It actually gets worse. It actually becomes worse. And that's a huge mental shift because when you start to dissect and look at the way these cities were built, they were built with an understanding that all the properties around you would continue to grow, would continue to expand, would continue to be added on to and improved in a way that we have a hard time dealing with today. Part of this is because of how we build. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the way that people approached building when they lived life at two miles an hour. So back to the beginning, we lived life at two miles an hour. Cities were about building wealth. When you were building wealth in a city with two miles an hour, the more wealth you built, the, greater your, the better your city got for everybody, right? So there was a, a certain pattern of building that evolved out of literally millennia of design uh, and building that would maximize that value for everyone, that would essentially accelerate the wealth creation business of building a city. Does anybody know what this is? This is the golden ratio, Adam, yeah? The idea here is that from a, a geometric form standpoint, uh, and, and this goes back to Greek and Roman time, there's an, there's an optimum form uh, for building. There's an optimum form because it, it mirrors other things in life that we see. We can go and, and look at these ancient buildings and they contain this, this same kind of form. If you think about this in a rough sense, uh, if you look at the layout of this, if you were to make this first split, flip it on its side, essentially it's geometrically the same. If you then split it again, it's geometrically the same. It's a fractal is what it's called. Essentially, every iteration is a, 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 a derivation of the prior. And when we start looking at this, what we see is that we see this in buildings, we see this in art, we see this in nature. Uh, this kind of pattern is all around us. And as humans, we are kind of set up and geared mentally to uh, relate to this type of form. It's a proportion that for us, it is very comfortable as humans. When we look back at the way things were built, and this is kind of the, uh, you know, one of the pinnacle buildings that was ever built in Brainerd was the county courthouse. Built in 1932, 34? 21. 21. Mm -hmm. 1921. If you can imagine these literally very poor people in the middle of nowhere coming together and building this grand building in a site that they had reserved specifically for this. They put the old courthouse right next door because they reserved this site for this grand building. Coming together and spending an enormous sum of money for a bunch of you know, lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere and farmers. Uh, this is an incredible building. When we overlay that, we see, you know, it has the same kind of form to it. This is a, this is a classical form, the width, the height, the dimensions, the way it's sectioned up, the symmetry, the proportions, the vertical nature of it uh, is all has this very historic construct that works incredibly well at two miles an hour. You can see the same thing in the city hall here in Brainerd. You see the same thing in the old depot building. These are buildings that have a certain grandeur to them because of their layout and their bulking and their size. The, these will draw your eye. They'll feel very comfortable to you walking past them because they mirror the proportions <coughs> that you see in nature and the proportions that you see in other human beings. We see this in the great buildings we have still in the downtown. And we even see this in buildings that in an architecture standpoint, you would call background buildings, buildings that don't stand out, that have no uh, you know, grand features, yet the way they were built and they were designed have the same kind of feature. 
the same kind of layout, the same kind of design. It was all designed for people at two miles an hour to feel very, very comfortable. When we contrast this with the stuff we build today, you see that we have lost that kind of human element to it. Uh, you know, these buildings look like they're drawn in a CAD program, which is what they are. They're not certainly scaled to us. They don't feel comfortable when you're walking near them. Uh, you know, we get this again and again and again. It's a different kind of dimensioning that is works at 30 miles an hour because you're not interacting with the building except superficially. If you're going to the courthouse, you pull up and walk in, and then it's a functional utilitarian kind of thing. Uh, you're not walking past it. You're not interacting with it. And you know, and as an extension, you're not planning and building it uh, so that it reflects wealth to other buildings and other properties around it. These types of things we see over and over and over again in the cities that we built years ago. Now, I'm going I'm to show you, and, and there's another picture I'll show you a little bit better uh, in a few. But this, look at, the, look at the width of the street here compared to the height of the buildings. This is that same golden ratio I showed you earlier. What you've got is you have a spacing across the street to height that is at just the right width and height ratio to make that space very comfortable for people to be in. If you've ever been to Manhattan, the feeling that you get in Manhattan is what? Over time, you, it's like you feel oppressed, right? And that's because that height to width ratio is messed up. It's really high and it's really, it, 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 it's, they're very wide streets, but it feels very tight because of the height of the building. It's, it's, it crushes you. It's like being in the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon, right? It's a very tight claustrophobic thing. Congestion. Kind of, yeah. You, you've all been in the, the parking lot of Walmart, right? Mm -hmm. That also does not feel comfortable. Nobody goes to the Walmart parking lot to hang out, and it's because it's not bounded by anything. It's very open. Humans, and sometimes we call this a sense of place, uh, but what we're really doing is, by building in this way, we're creating walls that are not so far enough as to be irrelevant and not bound, but not close, so close that they feel claustrophobic. You have the right ratio of height to width across where it feels very comfortable to be in the space. It feels very comfortable to walk through it. People feel safe. People feel comfortable. It's very relaxing. And when you're trying to build a city that creates wealth for people moving at two miles an hour, what you want is you want everybody moving through that space to feel very welcome and very comfortable. So that height to width ratio is a huge part of that. Another part of that is represented in this here, the windows. You'll notice how the windows go very low here. That signifies a retail establishment. You can still see this. And if, we, if we're able to do the walking tour tonight, if it's not raining, uh, I'll show you some of this out on the street too. Those low windows are meant so that kids can look in, everybody can look in and see. Uh, the more uh, permeability you have, the more comfortable that walk will be. The less permeability, the the the, uh, the harsher the walk becomes. Totally, kids would be a good example. Yeah, yeah, totally. You're you're exactly right. Um, the segmentation of the space. These buildings generally have very good symmetry. They're sectioned off into small sections, uh, so that you don't have long gaps and long stretches with nothing. Uh, all of these are little design tricks that didn't have to be put in regulations. No one had to write a regulation to tell people to do this. People understood that if we were going to, if I was going to make an investment that created wealth for me with my investment, here's how I would do it. Here's how I would build it. This is very different than, you know, what we do today in the 30 mile an hour where we're not really interested in that very intimate, very personal interaction. We're also not interested as much in creating wealth in adjacent properties, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Again, you see the height to width ratio, that room feel out here. The idea is, is to create an outdoor space that is comfortable for people to be in, that not only makes all of these buildings wealthier, but then makes the surrounding area wealthier. This is part of that incremental growth pattern. The more wealthy we can make the city, the more someone will want to buy that building and build the next intense thing.
Here's what we're going to talk about the individual incentives that were in play here. And I, I just took a picture of this building out here. <laughs> Does everybody know where this one is? Yes. Front it's on Street. Front Street. The old yesterday is gone. Yep. Would it, this building could be anything, right? It's a bar or will be a bar. It will be a bar now. What are some of the other things this building has been in, in people's lifetime here? The new Winnipeg. Winnipeg okay. since 38. Is it really? Okay. But we'll never know what the date is because there's that dumb sign up on top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You die, slur. <laughs> There's some really important things about buildings like this. First of all, <clears throat> and, and again, put yourself in the position of the people back here in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who were making small bets on the future of this place. They didn't know what would happen. They wanted it to succeed. They thought it would, but they weren't sure. What do you do when you're not sure? You build things that are really adaptable. So if it winds up where you know you have a little box and you think the bottom is going to be retail and the top is going to be uh, a hotel, and it winds up that someone builds a hotel next door and now this really doesn't work as a hotel, what can you do? Well, you, you can make it a house, right? You can make it a, a, a an apartment. Or what if it, what if you what if you wind up where you have too much apartment space and the rents really drop low for apartments? Uh, well, now you can make it an office space. Or you can make it a second floor retail if you had to. You can make this first floor into a restaurant or a dentist's office or, you know, any, any number of things can go in here. When you don't know what the future holds, what you do is you build things that are adaptable and flexible. So when we step back and we look at the construction of Brainerd, what we see is that the original design and layout uh, was one uh, meant to adapt to change, meant to adapt to whatever would come. I, I contrast this often with when we go south on, on 6th, uh, you run into the bank out on the edge that was the, the, the kind of cool investment, I think, of the 60s or 70s uh, that has been vacant for a decade now um, with a big sign out front. What is that building? It is a bank. What can it be tomorrow? A bank. What will it be a decade from now? It, a bank. It has to, it's, it's got, a, it's got three drive-through lanes and the, it's configured like a bank. It really would be very difficult to make that into apartments or make that into, you know, a retail establishment. It doesn't adapt well. And because of that, it sat vacant for a long time. These people couldn't, they, they, they didn't take that level of risk. They were not willing to take that level of risk. They needed to create wealth because they had to have their place survive. And in order to create wealth, you had to build in a construction manner that was very flexible and adaptable. And this type of construction is exactly that. Second, this was the original bootstrapping kind of endeavor. And if, if you think about a little box like this, this is just literally a little box. If you built something like this on the corner that meant you had money, because you had two sides now, you had to finish off and maintain. You had money, but the people who didn't have money, they went on the interior. Why would you go on the interior? Well, because you, share, you, you, you save money on walls, you save money on heating, you save money on a whole bunch of things when you were in the middle, as opposed to out on the edge. You also had a lot of flexibility here in terms of what you did. So let's say you were just getting started uh, and you were going to do a hardware store on the bottom. Well, let's say you didn't have enough money to inventory the whole thing out. You were just getting started. What could you do? Well, you could make the back of this first floor your house, mind the store, and then the second floor you could rent out as hotel rooms or apartments or what have you. You could have multiple ways to cash flow. So if one day the hardware store didn't do well, you still had rental income. Or if you went without some rental income, you still had income from the first floor. Over time, as things started to go well, what could you do? Well, you could kick everybody out of the upstairs and move up and expand the store. When you got really wealthy, when things started to go really well, what could you do? Well, you could move out uh, to North Brainerd, buy the big house you know, next to the park, and then have your employee live above. And they could mind the store. 
and you could pay them. Now you were really wealthy. So what these buildings did is they allowed people with very little resources to bootstrap themselves to a, a better life. And remember when I talked earlier about those pop-up buildings and then how the city would grow incrementally? At any point in time in Brainerd's history, up until we hit really the Depression in World War II and made this very dramatic shift in how we built, there was a place for everybody in that system to bootstrap. So if you were dirt, dirt poor, you could go out on the edge and literally have like a pop-up shack and start. If you had a little bit more money, uh, you could start you know, closer to town, maybe in one of these mid-blocks. If you were very wealthy, you could be on a corner and have a corner lot. But in all those circumstances, what you were hoping for is that things would continue to grow and get better, and your little shack would turn into a two-story building. And your two-story wood building would turn into a two-story brick building. And your two-story brick building would turn into a four-story brick granite marble building. You were always moving to that next level of that next level on the continuum of wealth. Everybody benefited from that. Finally, uh, this building uh, represents the selfish self-interest of these people at the time. And this is really important. I, this took me a long time and reading a lot of sociology books to try to grasp this. Because, um, you know, people, we, we, we all think we live in like decadent times, right? Where people today are cruel and they're mean and you go online and you read the comments and oh, can people be that, can people be that mean? You know, I remember the days when people were nicer and kinder and everybody cared for everybody else. And no, hey, go, read, go read the Old Testament. And you just like, it's just littered with like stories of people being heathens to each other, right? I mean, read Greek tragedies. We, we have this long history of being human, right? When you look at this style of development, there's something really uh, underlying unique about it. What if, let's say that the person, there's, there's nothing on this lot, it was an empty lot, but the person here bought this empty lot in the, in the days of early Brainerd, and was going to make an investment here. And this person was the most selfish, self-centered, didn't care about anybody else in the world person that you'll ever meet. What would they do to maximize their own wealth? They would build. They would go out and they would build. And they would build right up to the line that everybody else was built in, because that would make their property more wealthy. They would build a building that had that golden ratio, it would, uh, it would front the street with good windows, good symmetry. In other words, they would build a building in their own interest, if they just cared about themselves, that by its nature benefited everybody around it. What if today all you cared about was your own selfish self-interest, and you were going to go out and build a, a building today on a, on a vacant piece of property in, in the city, what would you do? Well, you would want to have a big parking lot. You would want to have a berm to your neighbors. You'd want to have a big sign. And I'm going to pick on uh, one of our neighbors here, just to, just not because these people are selfish, but because this is the style of development that today uh, you know, is what our codes call for. This is what we build today. But you'll see that if this person tries to maximize their own value and benefit, what it actually does is detracts from those around it. It doesn't add. The great thing about the traditional development plan, the great thing about Brainerd's original land design was that it reflected our own human nature in a way that actually helped the city grow wealthy. So you're, you looking after you benefited you. And you looking after you benefited you and you, and it all made us all wealthier. It wasn't like we were great people, we were all working together, and let's go raise a barn. It was that we had a pattern that when you looked after yourself, it made me better. You see that? It's a very subtle difference. Okay. This is my favorite thing about Brainerd. Not the U.S. Capitol, but... <laughs> When we look at this building, has everybody here been to Washington, D.C.? No. No? Okay. You're looking down Pennsylvania Avenue. It ends at the Capitol building. Okay. 
Lafont was the architect who set this out. Washington D.C. is a uh, a city um, designed uh, to have great view corridors. Um, it's a it's a monumental city. It's a monumental design, and it's meant to have these great view corridors. Um, this is kind of the the pinnacle of this in the United States. But we see this in different places around the world. This is Penn Station in New York. Again, the street ended in this grand building. Uh, you, this is a, a building in China, you know, kind of a nondescript. But but again, at the end of the street, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, right in the middle of the street. This is the quintessential American one. I, I, I put this in at the last minute because I think we can all relate to this. Of course, this is Main Street at Disneyland. You've got Cinderella's Castle. And Cinderella's Castle is the thing we think of, you know, that's the thing you think about at Disneyland, right? But Cinderella's Castle, if it was in a field, would be really awkward. The thing that makes Cinderella's Castle actually work is this, is this. Do you see how you've got those ratios we talked about earlier? Yes. Right? It's not too tight. It's not too wide. It's at the exact right ratios. If you've ever been there when they do the fireworks, it's tight. Like they could use some more room, but they'll never build it. They'll never build it because they'll lose those ratios. In fact, what they've actually done here, um, if you, the next time you're here, and I don't want to ruin Disneyland for you, but the next time you're here, look at these buildings, and you'll see they use a technique called forced perspective. Uh, it's an artistic technique, but they've applied it to the buildings like a movie set. So the second and the third stories are smaller. So the first story is a normal first story. It's actually seven-eighths of a first story, but it looks, it's pretty normal to your eye. But the second story is five-eighths, and the third story is, I think, half. So instead of being a ten-foot high, it's only five feet high on the outside. And what that does is it makes it look taller than it is. It gives it like a cartoon effect almost. An illusion. An illusion. It's exactly what it is. So, so what you have here is you have a street at the right proportions that is broken up in a very you know, engaging way with the windows and the displays, the low windows. But, and here's the most important part of this, what this does is it creates a picture frame of the castle. That's the effect. That's the effect. And so what you're doing is you're actually creating the image of the, you've got the castle there. Like I said, if the castle's in a field, it would look weird. What you've done is you've created a castle and then you've created a beautiful picture frame that brings it out. And here they've actually done things like they elevate the street at a really subtle grade so it, it actually looks taller. The castle itself has forced perspective too. So when you're far away, or when you're at the end of the street, it looks like it's far away. It's a block and a half. It is so <laughs> like close. And then you get up, and then all of a sudden it's there, and it's huge. It's an illusion. But it's a, it's a good way to visualize this, because people back in the early days of this city building this used this technique as well. They used this creating the picture frame and then putting the important thing at the end and framing it. And they didn't do that because they loved Cinderella's castle, right? In our city, they did it because what it did is it made every one of these buildings along here really, really valuable. If you were going to put in, and we've got two of these views here, but I'm going to show you the first one. If you were going to, in the early 1920s, co collectively tax everybody to build this grand building, it better function than more than just a place to have trials. It better actually make properties worth more money. You know, cities now today, we have these debates over, oh, we have to have all the government property in our downtown, so our downtown lacks tax base. Back then, they would fight for it. They would fight for it because we didn't build, if you built a usable government building, it was a government building that was meant to be torn down and rebuilt in a generation. We built a lot of those. We built cheap government buildings, but the idea was we were going to build a cheap government building that would last 20 years, 30 years, and then we'd tear it down. Or, like the county courthouse, we're going to build a cheap county courthouse, but we're not going to put it on the prime lot. We're going to save the prime lot, 
for the prime building. Because when we put the prime building in, we want to put it in the prime location because what that will do is it will make everything on that street more valuable. We're going to take the investment that we're making collectively and magnify it. So we put the courthouse at the end of 4th Street. The theory being everybody on 4th Street now would walk out their door, look down, and have the nicest building in the entire county right there. And it would be framed, ultimately, and it was for many years, we've kind of torn them down, um, it would be framed by buildings all along it would create that picture frame. When you get north, it would be the trees and the houses. When you get to this part, it would be buildings between Front Street and Washington Street and here that would frame it and make that building pop. This was our great investment. Our other great investment was this. And this started as a forest. Um, and it's funny because uh, there's a, there was a court case where they argued over who actually owned this, um, which, is, which as a planner was kind of crazy because when I look at the plat, it, immediately I see where the square is, right? It says Gregory Square on there. And a square is not for development. A square is for uh, terminating the street like this. And the role of the square is to actually make all the buildings around it for blocks really, really, really wealthy. This is a kind of a poor man's trick to building wealth in a community. I mentioned Savannah earlier. If you've ever been to Savannah, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, you just walk from street to street, and every like three streets, there's a, there's a square like this. They're smaller, but the, street, the, the city is just a collection of squares. And what happens is, on each of those squares, at the corners, those are really valuable buildings. In between them, the buildings are really valuable. And then what it does is the gap between, from this square to this square, you have the highest property values here, and then it drops in between. Okay? Drops in between, but, but a little, because the squares are so nice. Those squares are designed to make everything around it really wealthy. And so the idea was we would have South 6th Street, 6th Street here, that would run and would end here in this park. And on day one, it wasn't spectacular, right? It was, just, it, was just a, it was a pine forest. But over time, you can see that these people had a vision for what they were going to do. They, they put in the, the wading pool, they called it, the fountain. They put in uh, you know, these little things, abutments here, in, in a symmetrical way. The buildings, you can see uh, how you know, we, we lined the street in this way. The idea was to create that picture frame. Uh, over time, that changed. And as, South, as 6th Street became uh, a, you know, a thing to be experienced at 30 miles an hour, as opposed to be something experienced at 2 miles an hour, uh, what the building started to do in reaction was turn their back on the street. The street became a, a, an afterthought, a nasty place. And so instead of fronting the street with the park and creating wealth all along it, the street actually became a thing that, that kind of started to destroy wealth. So everybody turned their back on it. You can see Lincoln School fronted the street. Now today, if we were to build Lincoln School on that site, it would face the other way. We would never try to pick up and drop off kids out on, on uh, you know, 6th Street. Um, and you can see on the opposite side of the YMCA, when they redid the Y, they put the entrance on the other side. You put the... You put your butt to the street because it's not creating value for you. But Gregory Park, the idea was that this was where essentially like the wealthy people would live. We were going to create a part of town that would be kind of the end of our Grand Boulevard. Our Grand Boulevard running the whole north-south spine of the city would end in this park and the wealthy people the wealthiest people would want to live right around it because that would be two blocks from the central downtown where the theaters were and the restaurants were and all the great stuff that you would want to do was right there. And you would have this park. You can see, and again, Washington, D.C., uh, I said LaFont, one of the things about a monumental city built with a great amount of symmetry. Uh, if you've ever been on the National Mall, Got, this is from the Washington Monument looking towards the Capitol building. If you turn the other way, you'd have the reflecting pool and the, the uh, Lincoln Memorial at the end. Great symmetry. 
the symmetry uh, is part of creating uh, a, a very powerful expression of a park. Uh, it's really one of the ways you project that wealth. Uh, this park has great symmetry to it, um, you know, or, or, or did or should. Uh, at times in the past it has. You certainly look at the vision for what people had of this park uh, back when it was being developed, when those abutments were put in, when the fountain was put in. There were plans for, you know, Roman columns, uh, reflecting pools, gazebos. Uh, this was, you know, and it, it, the vision for this was very much in line with building uh, a very powerful, symmetrical park that would project wealth to the adjacent properties and many, many, many blocks in every direction. You can see that, you know, the, 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 in the early days, because of, I, because of this, you see the churches that, and I'm guessing, I don't know the history of all these churches, but what you see in a lot of these communities is that uh, the wealthy people would buy up these lots and then donate them to the church as their, you know, I can have this part of the church named after me then or whatever, or I can get a nice burial spot or, you know, um, <laughs> get a, you know, we're ca I'm Catholic, get out of purgatory a little bit more quickly, whatever it is. Um, and then you had, you know, the, the wealthy homes, the very nice homes that were built. Some of the nicest homes in the city are right adjacent to this park. This was, uh, you know, where uh, the epicenter of wealth in the community was to be located. Um, kind of one of the last things. What were these crazy people thinking when they built this water tower, right? I, I, I found this website today. It's called strangeminnesota.com. And they actually have our water tower. It's like, what, what were they thinking next? What were they thinking? I mean, today, it kind of, in some ways, it's kind of a white elephant. Like, what is this castle in the middle of our town? What was this all about? Um, I've thought long and hard about this. Because I, 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 don't, I don't know what they were thinking. But I, I've got to guess that at least part of it was this. And I'm going back. Disneyland is such an interesting thing because they've done so many planning things in the hyper that it's an easy place to point to. They, they do this thing at Disney. Uh, they actually internally call it a weenie. And the idea of it is that they want you to be able to orient yourself wherever you're at in the park. So if you kind of know where things are, like this is the castle, this is Matterhorn Mountain. If you know that Matterhorn Mountain is in Tomorrowland, you can stand there and go, okay, that's the Matterhorn. I'm not trying to get to Tomorrowland. I'm trying to get to Adventureland, so I've got to walk the other way. The idea is to have something grand, tall, that would orient yourself. And I think in many ways, what they were trying to do is not just have a water tower as an orient position, but have something that would be taller, grander, that would actually be like an orientation kind of thing because that really defines uh, a place. <coughs> I also think, and this is compliments of Adam, I love this photo. Um, Adam is something about uh, I love it. Um, you know, when I walk out of my office, at, I often work really late, and I'll walk out of my office at the Northern Pacific Center, and when I walk out building number five, uh, there's the water tower right there, all lit up. It's, you know, I got the tracks <coughs> right to it. And it's like, it's, a, it's like a landmark. And I, I really think that in many ways, these people were thinking big. They were, they were thinking bigger than what they were, than who they were. They actually had a grand vision for what they thought this place would become. And a castle water tower, when you have a grand vision of who you are and what you become, does not seem pretentious at all. It does not seem crazy. It, it, it seems ambitious, yes, but it doesn't seem nutty, right? I think these people had a grand vision, and I actually buy into this grand vision. I actually think that this is a great city with a lot of potential. And, and I, I look at, you know, the things we do today, the potential that we have today, and, you know, I, I hope we never tear that water tower down, because I, I do think it embodies uh, a certain optimistic view of who we are and who we, we, we can be uh, that I think is, a, is, an, is an echo, is a whisper of these people that came before us. So I want to close by talking about 
how successful these people were. These people who built the city. And I started off saying, there's two, there's two things, right? First of all, we have to put ourselves in their shoes and try to experience it at two miles an hour. And when we experience at two miles an hour, we can see the building forms, the building types, the layout, the interactions, all these things that are designed to do the second thing, which is create wealth and build wealth and make the city wealthy and prosperous for the people who lived here, for the businesses, for everybody within the community. When we talk about wealth, we have a very distorted way of looking at it at the city government level. Um, and I really want to get you to look at it in the way farmers look at land cultivation. When we talk about a farm field, we never talk about a farm field in terms of its yield, how much did you get total. We always look at it as how much did you get per acre. If you have a farm and you produce a million bushels of corn, and you have a farm and you only produce a half a million bushels of corn, uh, you know, if, if, if you and you have the same amount of land, you're a genius. You're producing twice as much as you are, right? That's how farmers look at things. As cities, we tend to look at it in a very different way. Um, I think this is best captured when we think about vehicles, because we all <laughs> understand the notion of uh, fuel efficiency, right? But if we were to go and say, what if instead of uh, miles per gallon, we said miles per tank? <clears throat> what, 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 what car has the biggest tank and can hold the most gas? We would say that you know, the Ford F-150 is the greatest vehicle out there, right? <laughs> but we don't do fuel that way. Because fuel is this finite resource. And what we're trying to do is say, how do we get the most from that expenditure. So when we actually ask a different question, given a set amount of fuel, how much do you get for it? We get a totally different set of metrics, right? All of a sudden, you know, the BMW Asena or the Toyota Prius is, is a lot more efficient. It's a lot more effective. You get a lot more return for every dollar of fuel that you put into it. Are you tracking with me? When we look at the city of Brainerd, what we see is a, a, some amazing things jump out at us. For instance, uh, the biggest investment when I was growing up was the Westgate Mall. We came in, we built the Westgate Mall, we got a new theater, we got the Westport Mall, we got a new theater. Uh, I used to uh, sneak my uh, girlfriend at the time uh, into the, you know, we, we would, we would uh, not tell our mother, my mother-in-law sitting right there, where we were going, <laughs> and we'd go to the movies together, and. Uh, you probably knew anyway. <laughs> probably figured what we were doing. My mother knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this was the huge investment. And when we look at it, you know, today, 23 acres, uh, $6.5 million in tax. It produces $120,000 in tax a year. That's a huge investment. When the Westgate Mall people show up and say, we want to do X or we want to do Y, we just start like, wow, you're a huge taxpayer. Let's talk to you. When we look at the uh, downtown, Right, right outside here, these nine blocks right here, uh, you've got 16 acres, but those 16 acres are producing $20 million in taxes. We're actually on a per acre basis getting four times the tax revenue from out here in this 19 acres than we're getting at the Westgate Mall, those 23. Now, there's 134 different properties out here, so not any single one of them is generating an enormous, you know, no one can walk in and say, well, I'm paying $100,000 in taxes here. Everyone pays a little bit, but in aggregate, miles per gallon, not miles per tank, that is a huge payoff. That is a huge payoff. When we look at it in miles per tank, this is pretty big. When we look at it in miles per gallon, this is huge. We see this in aggregate all over. This is a map of Crow Wing County. And what you're looking at here in the vertical is value per acre. Where are the properties that are the wealthiest on a per acre basis? Where are we producing the most wealth? And as an engineer, when I look at a map like this, I'm thinking, you know, we put a street down, a street costs so much per foot, pipe costs so much per foot, sidewalk costs so much per foot. Where with those investments are we getting the most back? Where is the land on a per acre basis worth the most? And this is just a side shot. Um, there's Perch Lake, there's White Sand Lake, there's uh, round. Um, 
Here is 371. That's the 371 strip right there. There's downtown Brainerd. There's North Brainerd, Northeast. That's South Brainerd. Good. I'm going to zoom in on this part right over here and show you if we're going to grade our ancestors on how well they did creating wealth, they killed it. They did great. They built an incredibly wealth producing city. This outperforms in, in a massive, massive way anything along the 371 strip. Anything. It just kills it. This is uh, over here. You've got, the, we're running through here. That's Coles. Uh, uh, that's Fleet Farm. That's Costco. That's Menards. The wealth that is trapped in this area here is enormous. When we look at North Brainerd, when we look at Northeast, even when we look at South Brainerd, which is often looked at as like our poorest you know, neighborhood down here, this stuff kills it when we compare it to you know, the, the neighborhoods in back of Southdale, uh, Wedgwood, you know, the, the, the stuff off of uh, White Sand Lake. When you say what they were trying to build wealth, how did they do? They did an amazing job. They did an amazing job building a lot of wealth. And really, we've been living in a world for the last 70 years at 30 miles an hour, where we've kind of discounted a lot of the things that they use to build and create wealth, we've kind of turned our back on, we've ignored, we've not really tried to maximize. Yet, look at the latent wealth that remains. This is top down, looking at, this is 371, this is 210. So there's Kohl's, there's Fleet Farm, uh, Cub Foods, there's uh, Costco, there's Home Depot, and now this is, South, this is 6th Street, going up to Gregory Park. What are some of the purple ones? Those are, I, I don't, on an individual basis, I don't know. We could, I could break into it and see, but there's a lot of them. Are like, there business? Right. Oh yeah, for the most part, there's some residences, but they're mostly businesses. Yeah. Why does yeah. this seem so counterintuitive? Because it's not the when way I, when that... When I drive up 371, I say, oh, Baxter is the new you, brainer. And I, I will say, it's because you're traveling at 30 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour. Here, here's, here's the one thing when you're driving up the highway. Um, and this is, you, 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 as an engineer, you, you, I, you kind of start to think this way. Um, between two hydrants is 400 feet of pipe, water main. You also have 400 feet of sewer, 400 feet of road, 400 feet of sidewalk and curb. In a city like Baxter, when you drive on 400 feet, you can realistically say 500, 600, $700,000. That's how much you've got in the ground. So drive along and every time you see a hydrant, just say three quarters of a million, you know, 600,000, 600,000, 600,000, and then look adjacent to that. And say, in a lifetime, is that what's adjacent gonna produce that much revenue? Never, never. Especially when you get to the residential neighborhoods, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Because you've got the stuff that's so spread out. And you, you, can, you can pay for it once. I mean, I, I did this for years. Menards would come in, Menards would say, we'll pay for the sewer and water, we'll pay for all that. But then it's yours to maintain. And what we find is that it that works really great for the first 25, 30 years. And then all of a sudden, the bills start to come due. And you just don't, there's not enough there, there. Everything's so spread out. It, it doesn't, it's a, they're negative returning investments. So it is counterintuitive in a way, but go look at like the old, the old Walmart site. What is the old Walmart site? Yeah, they're not. Half of it. <laughs> What's the other half? Parking lot. Empty yeah, space. it's nothing. It's empty space. But, you know, the city has to fix that frontage road, fix that pipe, fix all that. We have a far more flexible, adaptable, wealth-producing framework in a traditional city format just because of the way it was initially set up and initially built. Please. I have a question. Uh, I can see the wealth, and that's, that's an amazing graphic to look at there. Yeah. But we do have a disconnect in the area between, in terms of uh, per capita income. Uh, per capita incomes in Brainerd are about half of what they are in Baxter. 
And so we can say, great, we've created this wealth, but then if you look at the average people working in Baxter, it makes much more sense to live in Baxter. In, in, in a way, um, I do think that you're, you're touching on some, uh, some very important things. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that you're, you, in Baxter, you have a very high burn rate mm -hmm. for wealth. You, you cannot live in most of Baxter without two cars. You cannot live in the Baxter without driving everywhere you go. You, for every car you have, you're spending about $8,000 a year in uh, insurance, gas, payments, what have you. Um, there are a lot of people in Brainerd, a lot, who uh, have a much lower burn rate than that and get by on much less uh, because they only own one vehicle or they share a vehicle. They don't own a vehicle. Or they walk to work like me. They walk to work. <laughs> it, it, again, we get back to, remember when I said the bootstrap thing? Mm -hmm. And like the, the, the framework, and I'm not saying that it's great today. It's not working today for everybody. It's not. Um, it could be tweaked to be a lot better for a lot of people. But even today with it not working for everybody, uh, it still is a place where you can get by on a lot less and have a lot higher quality of life than if you were to move to Barrows or some of the poorer parts of Baxter. Does that make sense? Makes sense, thanks. It, the, the, we just redid 13th Street, and I'm kind of in a mini battle with the county right now because if, if, you're, if you ever are, spend any appreciable time on 13th Street, what does 13th Street have in abundance? People walking back and forth all the time. All, all day, all the time, people walking, walking, walking. They've walked so much, they've actually made uh, paths in the ditches. They've walked so much. Um, the county just redid that. Not even no sidewalks, but no nothing. No, I just completely ignore anybody who would not be in a, in a, in a large vehicle. Uh, so, you know, there are simple things we can do to, to make it even better and have that wealth like work for more and more people. But... It, that's a little bit of a mental shift. I think the first mental shift is realizing this math, like this works, let's do more of this. Um, this is where I live today. My wife and I um, met in junior high and, and, and dated through high school and college and then after college came back here. Uh, she worked for the Pine River Journal as a reporter and I worked for Woodson Smith Nolting as an engineer and we bought the cheapest lot we could find halfway between where we worked and built this house. And we've lived there for, for 20 years. Um, we have been trying for a number of years to move here. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, the storm being the latest one, uh, we have not been able to move. But two weeks from today, we are actually purchasing this house here on 4th Street. And so, I grew up across from that house. Yeah, we, my, <laughs> my wife and I, these two little girls over here, are all going to now be residents of Brainerd. Uh, some of you have wanted for a long time. So, so I am, I'm giving this presentation, and I'm so happy to be here and be part of this. Um, for a long time, I've been kind of sharing some of this stuff, and I'm really excited now to become even more involved in the conversation here. So, thank you so much for the invitation and for being here. Uh, if you've got a couple things you want to chat about, otherwise, if it's not raining, I'm happy to do, what, what I plan to do is a one block that way, one block that way, uh, back and around. So just like that would be fast. four blocks, and just look at the street and we'll talk a little bit about it in real time. Please. Please. Maybe we can talk another time, I have another small session. Please. This is wonderful to hear this. And I mean, I've been proud of this city as long as I've lived here. Yeah. And I, I don't like hearing people run it down. And so thank you for standing up for Greater. Yeah, well, we have a lot of things to work on. But at the, at the core, I, I think if we recognize that this is a place built by some smart people doing really great things. Yeah, please, Jim. Uh, as you leave, uh, grab a cookie. Yes. Oh, please. Mary brought them in. They're back here, and there's a napkin. So uh, grab two cookies. I think there's enough for everybody. So donated by Cup Foods. Oh, wonderful! So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk down. I'm parked right across from the. Uh